Hey everyone, and welcome to this, the final part in our Stumac Dreadnought guitar build. In this video, we'll be building the neck, installing the bridge, and finally getting to play this guitar. If you're new to this channel, you might want to check out part one up here. And of course, don't forget to subscribe for more guitar building shenanigans just like this. And now, on with the show. When we left off last time, I had just completed the body and things were starting to take shape. With the sound chamber done, it was time to move on to our user interface, the neck. Our first task is going to be installing the truss rod and ebony overlay for the headstock. This block of wood plugs the truss rod channel to keep it from riding up. After it's glued, we trim it flush with a chisel. Before installing the overlay, you'll want to clamp the fretboard in position. That way we can use the nut as a spacer to make sure we have a perfect channel for our nut to slide into later. When gluing the overlay, you'll want to make sure you have plenty of clamps to keep it tight on all those edges. It wouldn't hurt to use a call either. I used my bandsaw to cut away some of the excess and trim the rest with a chisel and sanding block. Be careful here because it's easy to tear out pieces of the ebony if your blade catches it the wrong way. So when you get close, it's a good idea to switch to the sandpaper. Now onto the fretboard. The first thing we need to do is find the center line of the neck and the fretboard. On the bottom of the neck, you'll want to use a piece of tape to cover the truss rod hole and make your mark there. With the neck lined up and clamped in place, you can mark out the overhang with a pencil. Now, most people I've seen cut off the excess on a bandsaw, but I prefer to use the belt sander. I find it allows me to sneak up on the line and gives me just a little bit better control. But that's just me, so of course, do what works for you. To true up the edges, I've glued 60 grit sandpaper to this 3 foot carpenter's level. Running it along the edges will take off any lumpy bumpy bits and give us a nice straight line. At this point I wanted to be sure the fretboard wouldn't shift, so I drilled two holes and installed these indexing pins to keep everything firmly in place. I used sandpaper and a card scraper to remove the last bit of overhang, leaving the fretboard and neck perfectly flush. By the way, those little pads you see under the clamps are pieces of scrap leather. They make a great cushion for the clamps, and if you have any laying around, I highly recommend you try them. To install the truss rod, we'll need to drill a hole big enough for the adjustment collar to slide into, then it's just a matter of tapping it in place. Now that we can see how the fretboard will sit on the guitar, we can go ahead and trim off that extra material at the bottom. Next, we'll mark the placement for the inlays. Now, in every guitar video I've seen, luthiers draw these diagonal lines to find the center of the fretboard. So, that's what I did. But in all honesty, I think there's a better way. I ended up double checking everything with my calipers, and I found them to be much more accurate than my pencil lines. Maybe it's just me, but I think next time I'll skip the lines altogether and just use the caliper. After all my marks were made, I double checked against the plants. It might seem silly, but it's easy to miscount and put a fret marker in the wrong place, so it's worth checking. To drill the holes for the inlays, you'll need a set of metric brad point drill bits. The sizes you need are 7, 6, and 5 mm. The kit unfortunately doesn't tell you the order the inlays go in, but after looking carefully at photos of Martin D28s, it seems that they go from biggest to smallest starting at the 5th fret. And if I'm wrong, well, it's my guitar anyway. With the holes drilled, it's time to install the inlays. A small amount of super glue and a little tap with a mallet is all that's needed. After that, it's time to sand. I used a 16 inch radius block with 220 grit sandpaper to smooth everything out, and wow, things are looking nice. Finally, it's time to glue up the fretboard. Those indexing pins I added earlier keep the fretboard from sliding around on that wet glue. You could use rubber bands for this, and the kit includes some, but I just like to use clamps. I don't know, it's just me. With the glue dry, it's time to begin shaping this neck. Since this is based on the Martin D28, the first thing you need to do is carve that diamond-shaped volute on the back of the headstock. I actually found this part pretty intimidating because not owning a Martin myself, I didn't really know what the Martin volute looked like. Nevertheless, I wanted to give it a try, and after a lot of research and careful thought, I was ready to begin. The process begins with marking out the areas to be removed. Next, we make a small cut with the chisel in the center of this area and then both sides are chiseled toward that line. The process is repeated on the other side, and of course the rough edges get smoothed over with a file. That large hump you see gets taken down when we shape the neck. Stumac intentionally leaves a great deal of extra material on the neck, so you can customize the profile to anything you like. 
It's really critical that you take the time to shape the neck and make sure it's comfortable to you. Now, I had actually never shaped a neck before, but it's not that hard. I used this template from Stu Mac based on a Martin D28, and that helped me to stay in the ballpark of where I wanted to be. I used a combination of rasps and razor files, checking my work against the template throughout. It's important to note that I didn't follow the template completely. It helped me get close, but my final shaping was determined by what felt right in my hands. I'd often get it to what I thought was the final shape, only to come back a day or two later and find something that I wanted to tweak a little bit. And so I kept coming back and playing with it until it felt perfect. And that's when I knew it was done. Now is as good a time as any to install those tuning machines. In the instructions, Stumac tells you to mark out and drill the holes, but it looks like they're pre-drilling them now, so all I needed to do was enlarge them slightly. That was nice and saved me some unnecessary work. Now that I'm done fretting over this neck, it's time to fret the neck. Stumac includes a small piece of fretboard for you to practice on. I'm not sure I needed to practice, but it was nice that they included it anyway. Now when you're doing this, make sure you support the neck well before hammering any frets. After you cut your fret wire, you'll want to use the hammer to tap in each side and then work your way toward the middle. This will help the tangs grab onto the wood. You may still find you need to use a small amount of super glue or epoxy if you have any fret ends that won't stay down. At this point I should mention that this could all be done before installing the fretboard. I like to do it this way so I can sand the fretboard flush with the neck without the frets getting in my way. Next we trim off the excess material with a fret nipper. I made these two blocks to hold a file, one at a 90 degree angle to even up the frets and the other at 45 degrees to give them a rough bevel. I'll come through later with a fret dressing file and round those ends some more, but this is a good starting point. Setting the neck is one of the most critical parts of a guitar build. What we do with this joint will determine whether the guitar is a dream or a nightmare to play. To begin with, you'll want to make a line along the edges of the heel. Using a chisel, we'll remove material from inside this line. The raised edge that's left is what we'll use to make our adjustments. To tilt the neck side to side, you'll remove material from only one side. And to tilt it up and down, you'll remove material from either the top or the bottom. To check the neck alignment side to side, Stumac tells you to locate the approximate position of the bridge and tape it in place. Then put a straight edge against the fretboard and measure the distance on each side to the holes in the bridge. I tried this approach, but to be honest, I felt like I got better results just using my own eyes to judge. That worked for me, but your results may vary. With the neck on straight, we need to check our vertical alignment or neck break angle. I can't overstate how important this step is. If we get it right, we'll have a guitar that's easy to set up and play. On the other hand, if we get it wrong, no amount of adjustment after the fact will make up for it. Fortunately, it's pretty easy to do. We'll need to lay a straight edge on the fretboard with the frets installed, of course. We're looking for the end of the straight edge to just graze over the top of that ebony bridge. If it contacts it, take off material from the bottom of the heel to tilt the neck up. And if it's too far away, do the opposite. By the way, it's a good idea to file these last few frets before installing the neck. Stumac sells a dovetail version of this kit, but I opted to go with a bolt-on neck. To install it, the only thing you need to do is glue the fretboard overhang. The neck joint itself is held very securely by the two bolts in the neck block. I have to think this design would make the neck very easy to remove, should it ever need to be reset. After clamping, I left the glue to dry for a couple days. A tool I haven't mentioned until now is this 3 degree reamer. These can be a bit pricey, but you're going to need one. The first time I used it was to create a taper for these bushings to go in. They were a bit of a tight fit, so I used a clamp to help press them in place. With the bushings installed, I drilled pilot holes and installed the tuners. I'll end up taking these tuners off later when I finish it, but you'll see why I installed them here in a minute. While there are many important steps to a project like this, positioning the bridge is one of the big ones. The method I use is a little different than what's described in the instructions. I like to start out by getting an approximate bridge position using Stumac's Saddlematic tool. Next, I clamp a straight edge to the top to use as a reference point. Then I clamp a temporary saddle to the end of the guitar and tune up the high and low E strings. This may be a little excessive, but what it allows me to do is play with very small adjustments to the bridge in order to get the best possible intonation. It also allows me to check that the strings are running straight down the fretboard. I should note at this point that finding the perfect bridge position is all about compromise. The funny thing about fretted instruments is that they can never play perfectly in tune all the way down the neck. 
If you try to get the low and high E strings to intonate perfectly at the 12th fret, you'll end up chasing your tail, with each adjustment to one pushing the other further out of tune. I find a good compromise is to let the low E string be slightly flat and the high E slightly sharp. The thicker strings tend to fret sharp, and when all is said and done, the difference will be imperceptible. Being satisfied with the bridge position, I installed two indexing pins to make sure nothing could shift during the glue up. I also clamped two straight edges to the body to use as positive stops. Having those guardrails in place makes the glue up a no-brainer. Speaking of the glue up, another thing I would strongly suggest you invest in are a set of these sound hole clamps. I've used cam clamps before, but I find these are much easier to fit inside the body and help me get a strong, even pressure over the entire bridge. Having had a bridge come loose before, I don't mess around now. You'll want to let the bridge dry for 24 to 48 hours. Then it's time to drill the string holes. With a call clamped against the bottom of the bridge plate, I use a 3 16 inch bit to complete the holes. Remember I mentioned that 3 degree reamer? Well, this is where you definitely need it. The bridge pins are tapered, so we'll use this reamer to taper the holes until each bridge pin fits snugly in place. Now it's easy to go too far, so shave just a little material at a time and check frequently. What we want is for each pin to just barely slide all the way in. In the instructions for the kit, Stumac says to use a bridge pin slotting saw to cut channels for the strings, but they also include slotted bridge pins. After a lot of reading, it seems like string slots are more a thing you do with solid bridge pins, and many manufacturers don't do it at all. So being happy with how my strings were sitting, I left it be. At this point, it was time to string up the guitar. I did the finishing work off camera using this clear tone satin lacquer, and did a basic setup to get the string height where I wanted. Finally, almost a year later, it's time to hear how this thing sounds. Take a step towards me So you can figure me out I've been hoping and praying For a single way To show you what I'm all about And I know And I know oh, oh, This is the only way of pleasing the crowd But when this is over and done with and we walk away There should be no doubt So let's get a little closer now Let's get a little closer now You say, you say That we're all tied up and wrapped around in useless, useless states of mind But at the same time we're still young We had the time to realize that we were wrong With me. Let's get out of this town so we can get a better feel for each other I'll take you back to when you remembered how you used to Just live your life a little for me Take the time to let it go Step away and watch me glow So let's get a little closer now Let's get a little closer now You say, you say That we're all tied up and wrapped around in useless, useless states of mind But at the same time we're still young We had the time to realize that we were wrong If you want to And I'd write to you and tell you how you've always been so special to me You can stay if you want to and I'll try You can stay if you want to And I'd write to you and tell you how you've always been so special to me You can stay if you want to and I'll try To keep you close to me 
keep you close to me To keep you close to me You say, you say That we're all tied up and wrapped around in useless States of mind But at the same time we're still young We had the time to realize that we were wrong. So, final thoughts. Is the Stumac kit a good buy? Should you get one? Well, for around $500 for the kit, and probably another $500 in tools, you can build a guitar that sounds every bit as good to my ears as the Martin D28 it's based on. I've done my best with the recording to give you an accurate picture of how the guitar sounds, but I still don't think it captures how big and resonant it is in person. It produces such a huge sound with sustain for days. The solid rosewood back and sides give it a bright and articulate tone while maintaining a good balance of low mids. If you've been watching my videos and following along with this project, you should have a pretty good idea of whether or not this is something you feel comfortable with. If you're thinking about it, I'd say go for it. Few things are as satisfying as playing a guitar made by your own hands. However, a project like this is time consuming, and if you really just want a guitar to play, you'd be better off saving up for that Martin. The number of hours you'll spend building this instrument is only worth it if you enjoy the journey. For those of us that do, a guitar like this is worth every penny and every minute spent. Thanks everyone, and see you in the next one.